Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. In the previous lecture, we derived the neutron diffusion equation, including this Helmholtz form of the equation, and today we're going to discuss how to solve this equation for the scalar flux as a function of space. Let's consider that we're trying to solve this equation for a one-dimensional slab of homogeneous material. This slab extends infinitely in the y and z dimensions, and so thus the del squared Laplacian operator reduces to the second derivative of phi with respect to x. Our differential equation know-how tells us that the only solution for this equation must be some combination of sine and cosine terms. You can probably guess that the b constants in this expression must equal the material buckling, bm, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. To solve for the a and b constants in this flux expression, we're going to need to introduce some boundary conditions. But first, let's say that the term little a represents the total thickness of our slab, and we'll define the bounds of our slab such that it extends from x equals negative a over 2 to positive a over 2. The point x equals 0 is located at the exact center of our slab. Our slab is comprised of the same material on either side of the center line. Because of this, the flux must be symmetric around the center line, reaching a maximum value in the center of the slab. If it is to meet these conditions, then the derivative of the flux must equal zero at x equals zero, and another way of phrasing this is to say that the net current, which equals negative d times the grad of phi, must also equal zero at the center of the slab. This makes sense, since there is no net flow of neutrons in the center of a symmetric slab. On average, the same number of neutrons go in either direction around the center line. Since the derivative of sine is cosine, and the cosine of zero equals zero, there is no possible way that the neutron current or that the flux's derivative could equal zero at the center of the slab if the sine term exists. Thus, the A2 constant must equal zero, which means that the flux in our slab is simply this cosine function. Now what else do we know about the system, and what other boundary conditions can we introduce? Well, we also know that our system cannot produce an infinite number of neutrons, and so if we were to extrapolate the flux in our slab, the flux must approach zero at some arbitrary point, which is plus or minus a tilde divided by two. The flux is not zero at the boundaries of the slab, since fuel at the edge of the slab can still fission and must still see some neutron flux, but we can assume that the flux will decrease to zero at some point beyond the fuel. Nuclear power is pretty awesome, but it's not awesome enough to produce an infinite number of neutrons. So if we want our flux to approach zero at the extrapolated boundary, and we know that our flux must be defined by this cosine function, then the b term in the cosine must equal some odd number n times pi divided by a tilde. Because n can be any odd number, this means that our flux can actually be represented by this infinite sum of fluxes. So how do we know at what point we should assume that the flux equals zero? How far outside of the slab do we need to extrapolate? Turns out that we can find this extrapolation distance through the use of vacuum boundary conditions. Vacuum boundary conditions state that the incoming current at the boundary of our system equals zero if our system is surrounded by vacuum. This makes sense. Neutrons that leak out of a system that is sitting all alone in vacuum have no possible nuclides to scatter off and no possible way to be reflected back into the system. They're simply gone forever. We can solve for the incoming current at the boundary by integrating our p1 approximation for the angular flux over the negative 2 pi half sphere. After working through the math, we see that the incoming current equals the scalar flux at the boundary divided by 4 minus 1 half times the net current at the boundary. Next, we can apply Fick's law to replace the net current term with negative d times the gradient of the flux at the boundary. So what is the gradient of the flux at the boundary? In the x dimension, the gradient simply equals the derivative of the flux with respect to x, and we can use the secant rule to approximate this derivative using this combination of the flux at the boundary and the flux at some point delta x beyond the boundary. If we assume that this delta x equals the extrapolation length, then we know that the first term, which is just the flux at the extrapolation length, must equal zero. And so our equation for the incoming current only depends on phi at the system's boundary, the extrapolation length, 
and the diffusion coefficient. We can cancel out the phi term, and after solving for delta x, we find that the extrapolation length must equal 2 times the diffusion coefficient. This is a very useful expression, since the extrapolation length does not depend on the system's flux at all. It only depends on d. Furthermore, we can rederive this expression using cylindrical or spherical coordinates, and in each case, we find that the extrapolation distance does not depend on the system's flux, and it just equals 2 times the diffusion coefficient. We can also finagle with the extrapolation distance to make this approximation even more accurate. After comparing the diffusion approximation with high-fidelity radiation transport simulations, nuclear engineers have found that we can improve the accuracy of the diffusion solution if we assume that the extrapolation distance equals 2.1312 times the diffusion coefficient, which is also equal to 0 0.7104 times the transport mean-free path. This minor correction is one of the most common and most helpful fudge factors for improving the accuracy of the diffusion equation, and it's something that you should, and will, use in all of your diffusion equation coding assignments. Getting back to our flux solution, so far we found that the neutron flux is given by this infinite sum of cosine functions. Thankfully, the final flux it will arrive at won't be an infinite series, so let's simplify things a little bit. First, we will temporarily rescind one of our prior assumptions and allow the diffusion equation and flux solution to be a function of space and time. From here, we'll assume that our flux is separable as a function of space and time, which means that the flux can be split into a time-dependent term, p of t, multiplied by a space-dependent shape function, psi of x, that have no relation to one another. This means that if the power goes up or down in a reactor, that the flux magnitude simply scales up or down. The shape of the flux does not change. Now this is never actually true in a real reactor, because a reactor's temperature will change unevenly throughout the core as the reactor's power increases, and the higher temperature regions will see different feedback effects compared to the lower temperature regions. But for now, this isn't a terrible assumption to add on top of our existing diffusion approximations. Next, nuclear reactors tend to be exponential beasts, so it's also not a terrible assumption that our reactor's time-dependent power follows this exponential function, where lambda n is the time rate of change constant for our reactor for the nth term of the flux. If we plug this time and space dependent flux representation into our time dependent diffusion equation and recall that the gradient of our cosine flux is just negative bn squared, then we can cancel out the phi of x and t term from both sides of this equation and arrive at this expression for the nth lambda time constant. So thus, our flux is now this infinite series of exponential and cosine terms. If we look back at our equation for bn, we notice that bn and lambda n both increase as n increases, which means that lambda 1 is the smallest of all the lambdas. This means that each successive term in our flux's infinite series is multiplied by an exponential function with an increasingly negative exponent. These third and fifth and etc. terms are known as the higher modes of the flux, or as the higher order eigenmodes of the neutron diffusion equation. Because these higher order terms have increasingly negative exponentials attached to them, they will all decrease to zero rapidly over time. If, for example, we flipped a switch and turned on a critical nuclear reactor just like we're turning on a light bulb, these higher order eigenmodes would oscillate for a while, but they would eventually decay away and leave a flux that is described only by the lambda 1 term, which is known as the fundamental mode of the flux. A positive lambda 1 corresponds to a subcritical system, since the time-dependent term has a negative decreasing exponential. A negative lambda 1 corresponds to a supercritical system, since it implies a positive exponential term. And if our reactor is to stay exactly critical, then the flux must stay constant with time, which means that lambda 1 must equal 0. Thus, if our system is to remain exactly critical, then the b1 term from our fundamental mode cosine flux 
must equal nu sigma fission minus sigma absorption all divided by d, which is just the material buckling for this system. B1 equals 1 times pi divided by A tilde, which allows us to solve for the extrapolated width of our slab as a function of the material buckling. This relationship makes sense. Systems with higher fission cross-sections or lower absorption cross-sections should require a smaller critical mass. Likewise, systems with lower diffusion coefficients will prevent neutrons from leaking out of the system, which also lowers the required critical mass. This B1 term is actually known as B sub G, the geometric buckling. The geometric buckling of a shape describes how easily neutrons will leak out of that shape. Certain shapes, such as spheres and cubes, have more mass concentrated into a smaller volume, which reduces the chance that neutrons will leak and thus lowers the shape's geometric buckling. On the other hand, shapes like a big flat pancake have higher geometric bucklings since they are so spread out. Neutrons in these shapes are more likely to exit them than they are to head towards other fuel regions. If a shape's geometric buckling is greater than the shape's material buckling, then it means that the system is more leaky than it is able to sustain a chain reaction, which means that it will be subcritical. Similarly, a system whose geometric buckling is less than its material's buckling will be supercritical, and a system whose geometric buckling exactly equals its material buckling will be exactly critical. Our previous boundary condition, that the flux must equal zero at the extrapolated boundary, causes our geometric buckling to only depend on the reactor's shape. The geometric buckling has no dependence on the reactor's fuel or cross-sections. A 5 cm radius sphere of highly enriched uranium will have exactly the same geometric buckling as a 5 cm sphere of low enrichment uranium. However, the HEU sphere is more likely to be critical or supercritical because it will have a larger material buckling than the LEU fuel. This concludes our lecture on solving the neutron diffusion equation for a 1D slab. We have introduced some of the boundary conditions that we'll see when we solve the diffusion equation, and now we can determine the flux shape or fundamental mode for a 1D slab. We still have many more aspects of the diffusion equation to explore, and in the following lectures, we'll discuss how to solve the diffusion equation for different geometries, for multi-body systems, and also how to estimate the eigenvalue of a system.